Welcome into Rounding the Bases, the podcast about culture and leadership with a baseball twist or a bit of a football twist in part for this episode. My name is Joel Goldberg. Hope that you are doing well. And uh, we're getting close uh, by the end of December to rounding out what has been a very long and productive season six of Rounding the Bases. And again, can't thank Community America enough for their partnership in this podcast of bringing forth so many interesting people, stories, strategies, and causes as well. Joining me today is someone who has built a career around the potential of people. As a collegiate Hall of Fame track star turned NFL football player, he's no stranger to the influence a great coach can have. But it's when a coach can find a way to simultaneously harness natural talent while also tapping into latent abilities that the magic happens. As the regional vice president of a leading HR firm, he has played a critical role in matching candidates to positions, putting both on the path to success. And now he has concentrated his experience and used them to set even loftier goals. I'm talking about a man named Kenny Randall, author, motivational speaker, founder of Forward Progress, with an eye towards helping others. His clients are now achieving bigger and better things than ever before. The trademark of a great coach and true leader, who has actually come to realize their own fullest potential. There's so many ways that I could introduce Kenny Randall. That certainly is one that covers a lot of ground. And a gentleman that I recently met virtually, haven't met in person yet, although he has much more background where I live now in Kansas City. He's in Dallas. That is his home, a former NFL player, longtime uh, business executive, among other roles. Kenny, how are you? I'm doing great, Joe. Hey, good to be on. It really is. I'm excited. Well, you know, you and I met really very organically through a mutual friend, uh, mm-hmm. Marquita Miller Joshua, who who I know from the speaking world and National Speakers Association in Kansas City. And she had asked me to come on and and do a virtual speech for a client of hers and, and had a uh, a list of guests. And so so I started and then and then I I, I was done. And suddenly the next guy was you. And I thought it was really cool because I felt a lot of synergy with you, even though you and I had never met before. Right. And I think it's a little bit of the, and I, I was very clear that day too. I'm not the former athlete. You're the former well, athlete. The problem I had was following you. So I said, I better do ah. a decent job on here. <laughs> well, you did do it. You did do a good job, but I, I think that, you know, some of that synergy just came from the fact yeah. that, that in different ways, both of us, have lived in the sports world and seen the similarities oh, yeah. to the business world and what a great teaching tool that is. I, I think you feel the same way, right? I totally feel the same way. Um, being around it, uh, I, I believe you get a chance to see some of the nuances involving sports and sports athletes, particularly from the pinnacle of uh, performers, the performers that are really at the top of their game, because people are really interested, in always wanting to know what makes them tick and why do they do what they do and how do they do what they do. So, and being around it, you find some unique uh, undertones. You are involved in a lot of different business endeavors. Before I get to that, because I don't, you, you're one of those guys to me that falls in that category of when people say, what does he do? They kind of say, well, <laughs> I can't really describe it with one thing because you're, and maybe I'm the, the same way. I mean, the easiest thing for me is to say he's a television broadcaster, but there's so much more and you have your hands in so much, but I want to go back to to the the football days. It's been mm-hmm. a few years, I know, but, yeah. but tell me about your 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 football endeavors and and your NFL career. Mm-hmm. Let, let me start by just making this statement about it because you actually said it in your intro somewhat. Uh, Joel, I've always been when I said in my belief, being blessed to being around great organizations, great people, and great causes. And if I look through my athletic career off through high school, coming out of high school, through college, into some pro ranks. I was always around great people. <laughs> I was always around um, great organizations and great causes. So that kind of set the pace. And you, you, you look at life so much more so through a rear view mirror than, than the front. And so as you look back, you see those uh, interesting parallels. You see the people you come across. You see scenarios you've been in. So for me, yeah, it has been uh, some time, but the lessons I think that I've carried forth out of those uh, uh, and never knew even when I was going through, obviously, when I was playing football, I never knew that one day I'd be on a podcast with a broadcaster, with a media person talking about uh, my sports life. Um, but 
those things you carry forward. So for me, uh, coming through high school athletics and, and so forth and being in Kansas City, that's my, my hometown, I was born and raised there, and getting an opportunity to go get a scholarship to go out to the University of Southern California uh, on a football scholarship, but I ran track. So I, I look back on that and say, well, they really just got the two for the price of one. They got one guy, but they, but they got two scholarships, so they didn't have to give the other scholarship out. They said, the guy can run track, so let's just, get, let's just bring him here. And uh, having played on a couple of national championship football teams, my freshman year, we went 12-0. Uh, mm-hmm. That team was recognized as one of the, the uh, greatest college football teams ever assembled. Now, I know everyone brags about the greatest teams. you got Alabama just mowing people down every year. Um, but you, you carry that forth in some of the college memories. So for me, uh, leaving that field, uh, you, you never put a timeline on uh, what's going to happen by when. You just always go forward saying, this is my course. I'm going to go out and I'm going to, uh, for example, um, when I ran track, I said, I'm going to be on the Olympic team. I'm, I'm going to make the Olympics. That was my goal. Uh, An injury just didn't allow me to get that far, <clears throat> but I did have some great uh, recognition exploits behind it. And then I got drafted uh, and uh, went into uh, got drafted by the Cleveland Browns hmm. out of out of college. And my roommate just happened to be from Cleveland. And he was like the third player picked in the National Football League draft. And uh, I was six round, seventh round. And so every day he was teasing me about going to Cleveland. I, and so we had a lot of routes back and forth. So for me, being able to uh, get to the place when I had sports starting to fade out and I knew it the, the good part about it Joe is I, I went to school getting an education I was I was a true student athlete <laughs> and I knew that I could do something with this education once I got out of sports now while I was in sports that, that was didn't really come uh to the forefront of my mind but I know one day I'd have to use it and um I won't use the word begrudgingly. I'll just say uh, methodically and systematically, I had to finally pull out of the sports uh, inertia and move into the business world. Which is a different discussion. I do want to get into that in a moment because I I believe, and you and I talked about this Mm -hmm. offline, that the pivot that athletes have to make Mm -hmm. because it doesn't go on forever is incredible. But I, I do want to go back a little bit to those football days because, mm-hmm. now of course, I, I like that you mentioned Alabama for anybody that's a football fan. I mean, USC was that back then, yeah, we right? Were. I mean, that, yeah. that just a powerhouse and, and and kind of comes and goes now. I'm sure that that could be a, a, a bright spot or a sore spot because there was a time where, you know, USC was untouchable and, 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 and again, to, uh, to some extent, well, I've still, learned but... to become emotionally detached over the last couple of years. <laughs> yeah, that's <it's> survival. <laughs> <laughs> that's survival. But, but I mean, there, there are some historic names mm-hmm. that came out of that program. And I mean, you'd list them off. I mean, I think about a Ronnie lot or something like that, but I mean, how, what, what was it like back then? Who, who were you hanging out with? Well, um, when I came in, um, actually, I, I was two years behind a, a great player uh, that played in front of me. His name was Lynn Swan. Hmm. And Lynn Swan went on to be an all-pro Pittsburgh uh, receiver. Um, and so Swan, we called him Swanee, and uh, played behind Swanee. Uh, and actually, I had an opportunity to introduce him to my deja vu. I introduced him on, as the keynote speaker at my company uh, three years ago. That was ironic. Now I'm introducing a guy I played ball with as a keynote speaker in the company I'm with. Uh, so it was it was amazing. Uh, for example, I mentioned that that national championship team I played on, uh, and I say this and I mean it. That team was so good, Joe, uh, that I believe the second team could have beat almost any major college wow. first team. That's how good they were. Uh, we were stockpiling all Americans, just like it happens at Alabama and Ohio State. And um, and everyone just played their hearts out because if they got in the game, they wanted to show what they can do. Uh, and they were all great players, just great players. And people like Anthony Davis, uh, I, I played with him and he was uh, and he was the third string running back. <laughs> and the only reason why he started is because two guys before him got hurt. And he made history after that when he had his chance. So he never let it go. Charles White. Charlie White, 
Yeah. Charlie White I was a freshman when I was leaving. Mm. He, he was okay, a freshman, so but we up. had another running back named Ricky Bell. Ricky Bell, yeah. That, that uh, should have won the Heisman. I think they, they gave it to Archie Griffin that year, and Archie was his second time getting it. Uh, but, yeah, Ricky Bell. So Charlie White was a freshman, played behind him. We went to the Rose Bowl, and we beat Michigan in the Rose Bowl when Charlie was a freshman. And mm. we knew Charlie was going to be a great player, uh, and he proved it, you know, as he kept, and he went on to Cleveland. I believe he was drafted by Cleveland coming out of college. So you, you you get out of USC, and are you thinking I've got a long career ahead in football? Or are you thinking I, I I need to think about what that that business or that that future path is beyond football? Let me let me back up for a second, Joe. That's a great uh, statement because you mentioned along the way along the way um, what actually occurred. Uh, I was. Um, it was Olympic year. I had the number one time in the world, my senior year and my junior year in my event, 400 meters. And, but I had a bad case of tendonitis in my left leg. And I recall my high school coach uh, from Kansas city, a guy named Charlie Lee. Charlie wrote me a letter when I was in school and it was somewhat short. And he began to talk about take advantage of this time you're in. He said, because the legs will not always be as fast as they are. And you'll never be as strong as you are. And you're a young barrel football. You don't want to hear that. Like, no, coach, I'm going to be good. But he was so right. Uh, But it stuck with me, Joe. It made me think, okay, if anything, I need to come out of this, no matter where I'm going, get an education, Get, get a degree. Or, or, or at least get to the point where you can come back and finish the degree. So for me, that transition, I wasn't uh, had one foot in, one foot out. I was all in. But once I knew that the Olympics were not going to happen for me and I didn't uh, come out of the trials uh, uh, with a victory, I had one more year football season. And that's when my coach, I'll never forget this. I went to Arizona. Uh, the Olympics were going on in uh, Montreal. Uh, and I was uh, slated to go against Juan Torina uh, from Cuba. And that was going to be the showdown. And I remember belly aching in his uh, condominium and talking. And as they were going on the victory stand, and I remember what he said as a good head coach would say. He said, you know what? You need to just shut up. <laughs> and he said, that's over with. You're not there. You got one more year of football. Make the most of it. And that's exactly what I needed, Joe, you know, because I, I always look for coaches and, and, and leaders and people uh, that I've been associated with in my life to tell me what I needed to hear, not what I want to hear. Mm-hmm. And he told me what I needed to hear, and it got me ready for that last year of, of football. And it, it didn't take the sting away from the disappointment, but it showed me I had so much more future. And I think in that in, in my book, I, I let athletes know that there's more than – uh, the now. And you, you've you only cultivated the now so well that it brought you to a pinnacle of success. But that same uh, inerrant desire and competitive drive and all the things that you have as an athlete is exactly what you need when you go to the next phase. You just have to get it reappropriated or find somebody to mentor you in that next place you're going. Well, I mean, there's so many lessons learned in sports. You know oh. that. And then just along the journey, you've been at this a long time. I mean, you you know, you're talking about uh, about running track and 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 catching touchdown passes back in the mid 70s. And and now uh, you are you know, you have many more years of experience in business than mm-hmm. you did in the athletic arena. Tell me about about your role in the business world and in Sparity. And I want to talk about your coaching too, sure. uh, but, but what you over the years were able to take from competing at the highest of levels to then taking that to the business world. Wow. It, that, that is a unique transition. Um, I talk about it uh, in, in, in the book because I'm writing about how I transition, even though the book is not about me, it's about the athlete. Uh, and, and the different uh, phases of it. And one of them for me was going into the business world, which is a highly competitive world. If you're in the midst, and I went to work for a major corporation, you have 
you have to learn how to be able to take those inherent natural attributes and now line them up into a business construct uh, and, and then be willing to ask for help. See, a lot of athletes that are great athletes, they're not always willing to ask for help mm-hmm. because they've all been so self-sufficient on their life. I can do it myself. I'll prove it. I can do it. I, you just watch me. Uh, the gladiator mentality they build in all of us yeah. when we're coming up, right? <laughs> so, but having to ask for help and ask for a mentor is so critical, particularly when you come into a new playing field. So for me, I was entering a playing field I was used to, and I still had confidence, not in what I was going to, but I had confidence in me. So when I was moving there, it took me some time. I always say I was a late bloomer. You know, I uh, I was in the uh, technology industry for several years, went to a big technology corporation when I came out of sports, and that was great. Uh, and I stayed in that, that uh, environment for a while until I finally found myself. Uh, mm-hmm. And what I mean by that, I, I found my rhythm. You know, what really worked for me? You know, what really was I best at? <laughs> and what was, and finding out the, the reality of it, what was I not good at? See, that's the harder part is this determining, okay, you're not that great at this, so you, you probably need to find something that fits you better. And so all those years of experience, mm-hmm. it's not, look, it's not just enough to to have your your role with, well, it could be enough. I'm not saying that it is, but you know, you, you've been, you've been at this for a long time with Insperity Regional mm-hmm. Vice President. I know that you will get back to Kansas City. Some of you are based out of Dallas, but you're also, you, you also have this speaking, motivational speaking. I'll talk more about your book in a moment too. Sure. Uh, and and co and coaching. When did that sort of crystallize for you? Because I sort of thought like the the further along you go on your journey, if you're lucky enough to have some success, there comes a point where you say, I want to share that with others. Not, hey, I'm good at this, but here's what I have learned. And and it's almost like, I don't know, for me, and, and you touched on something there too. I've never understood why the gladiator mentality has to exclude asking for help like somehow if you ask for help or advice that you're not any tougher whereas mm-hmm. i i think it takes courage to ask for help and i think it also oh, endears gosh. you to people to be vulnerable like that but then there's also that element of being willing to share what you know and yeah. and i'm pretty sure that's a huge passion of yours when did that happen you know i think it was progressive um there was some inherent i i, I having going back to that that component I share with you about being around great people and great organizations, being around that, it, it, it allows you to see it lived out. So you see that greatness lived out. You see people giving back to others and being around great coaches because I saw coaches change, change the lives of, of students as I was coming up, particularly in high school, because I came out of the inner city and I, I saw what the challenges were. I saw the things that had to happen, how it was so hard just for kids to come and be able to be on the field every day, let alone be in class every day. And I I knew that deficit uh, existed. So when I went on to the next level in college, that was just a whole new world for me. And and then getting involved with uh, this level of sports, then I had to see it all replicated again at a higher level with even greater coaches. (laughs) Even greater athletes, athletes I saw, I thought the athletes that I had dwelt with for a while were phenomenal. But when I went to the next level, I saw athletes I never knew existed that could be that big, could be that fast. And so um, it started moving me a little bit. I I believe that um, I never, this is really interesting, Joe. I'm glad you asked this question. I never wanted to go into coaching, say football or track, because I wanted to go after what I perceived to be the money. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm, when I'm in the business school. I'm going to take this business. One day I'm going to use it and go in business in some kind of capacity. But when I was actually running track, and people think this is ironic, that you can't really uh, uh, have the kind of unity that you would have in a football environment. But I found the ability to create it. And we won the national championship in track and field. I was the captain on that team. And even guys today that talk about how that team came together in unity. And I realized then that I had a passion to bring people together for a cause mm. and bring people together for a greater cause. 
And you, you marry that uh, against uh, some of my other uh, I call them veins in my life. I actually went down this ministry vein mm -hmm. as a result um, of coming on contact with the Dallas Cowboys. Um, mm -hmm. I got invited to a, a meeting. These guys were having a, a great spiritual experience in their meeting. Um, I thought it was wonderful, but I wasn't at the level they were at. So it kind of went latent for a while. It wasn't until later I, I realized I want to give back because so many people gave to me. I think as coming up as a single, in a single parent home, uh, my father died three days before I was born. So wow. I grew up without a father in my life. And I believe uh, that excelling and exceeding at, was probably a way of me making up for that boy. Even though I had great aunt, uncles, aunts, cousins, all the people, coaches, but still to try to prove I could make it. And I believe that was that filled that void for me to excel. Um, and now you wrap it all together and tie it together some type of way. And I've, I've always, even today, believe it or not, all the time that's gone back in sports, I still find myself uh, driven towards and those coming towards me that are the younger men, younger people, uh, because I have a heart for them. And I believe they can feel that. And today, the environment of we look, we talk so much about our younger uh, generation. I found that instead of trying to tell them what to do and to be, they're listening for someone to just listen to them mm -hmm. and be a sounding board as opposed to uh, attempt to tell them what to do. And that's what I make myself available to do. I do it with men, young men. Uh, I don't exclude women out of that conversation, but when it comes to uh, sports and so forth, that's just kind of been my, uh, my direction and i love it i really i really love it yeah you've got a passion for it and and i love that so let's get to my baseball themed questions which don't mm -hmm. have to be baseball related but you're you're well-rounded it doesn't have to be football either i love baseball what, but yeah look it, it's all it's all good but as i said earlier it's all very relatable and yeah. so that's why i love the baseball terms beyond the fact that i do it is we all hit home runs. We all have big moments. What's your biggest home run been in, in business or wow. I'm not going to say life. Cause I know a lot of guys go to marrying their wife. We, I hope mm -hmm. that's the case for everyone, but professionally <laughs> speaking, what has been your biggest home run? This is probably going to hit you. Uh, interesting. Um, the biggest home run I had, I have to think about this, but the biggest home run was me coming into the work that I do now when it was in its infancy when no one could really see it, it was a privately held company. Uh, we were creating a whole new industry that people were even wondering, is this even legal? Is it legal what they're doing? And to be able to come in, that's that timing again, at the right time, uh, and paid a lot of dues on the front end. Um, but to see that go from that privately held company to a publicly held company to be really the, the, the tops in, what we, in our space in the industry. To me, that indeed was the best home run I hit business-wise. If I shared things that have occurred within the company, awards, accolades, that, that would fall on deaf ears amongst your listeners. But I believe being in a place where you could actually find your rhythm, and I had no idea when I joined, I just knew something was different about this industry, about the leadership there and the people. And uh, I look back on it and say, that was the biggest home run I could have hit could have ever hit. And even today in my position, as people are coming in, I'm constantly uh, providing leadership and leading them and developing them because I understand the dynamics. You have to bring people up in order to be able to, to carry on a, a company and a business. Hmm. How about a swing and a miss? And what did you learn from it? Wow, business-wise. Uh, I've been doing this for a while, so I'm going to go back before this probably. It's, it's probably what led me to what I'm doing now. Uh, I was in uh, a share with you. I started with a big corporation. I started in the actual computer technology industry. And I was real excited about it, Joel. All jacked up excited about it. I knew this. Is, but you know why I was excited? And I, and I actually share this in my book. Um, I was excited because I was around other people that told me that's a great industry. That's a great company. You need to get connected with them. You need to see if you can get a job with them. And 
I did it from a competitive standpoint. I said, well, gosh, you're right. You know, I'm coming out of sports. You know, this is a great company. They've got outstanding training. You know, I can get in here and probably get my, some of my aspirations and goals met for going and doing something else. So as I look at it and look back on it, I wasn't really fit for that. I, uh, it was, it was uh, now, I wasn't in love with computers, but I do appreciate computers. And I sold it, but I realized I was better at doing intangibles. I was better at uh, talking about concepts and ideas and painting a picture for business owners in terms of what can happen for their organizations and what can happen for their people. So for me, that was, it was a miss, but it really wasn't a total miss because of what I gained. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can have misses and all of us have had misses, right? But what have you gained from the misses? I yeah. always look back on what it was bad. Yes, I didn't like this uh, disappointment, maybe. Uh, and, and, and by me transitioning, I found myself out of work. I mm. found myself out of work and it gave me a lot of time to contemplate about the next move. Uh, my wife was not excited about that uh, because she wanted to see things get perpetuating. And but for me, it was the best uh, time I could have spent recalibrating repositioning uh, myself and really going back at this again. And I was fortunate enough to uh, come into the space I am now. And now I've been able to help a lot more people. They're not misses if you learn from them. They, they become big yeah. misses or losses when you make the same mistake uh, again. And so to me, they're productive when you, when you end up gaining from them. Last baseball feed question, small ball. You just talked a little bit about intangibles. To me, small ball is intangible. Small ball to me is... I heard somebody say this recently, and it, it really summed it up. I don't think I ever used this expression in my book, but mm -hmm. small ball is is what are you doing when people aren't watching? You, you know, mm. you remember that as an athlete, but that goes yeah. into business, that goes into life. What it is does. small ball to you? What are the little things that add up to the big results? You know, I, I would start, it's probably not in the exact order, but I'll give you a couple that I think are important to me. They're small. Uh, one is consistency. One is being consistent. A, a lot of individuals, uh, when they look at people who have been extremely successful. Now, certainly, say in our realm that we've dwelled in with sports, you know, there's some people just have ability off the charts. And they're so good that they don't have to do certain things and they can be good because they're just naturally endowed with great athletic ability. Mm -hmm. But the truly great individuals, even those with great athletic ability, I've known that have won championships or done great endeavors year after year of those who have been the most consistent. Even business owners that run businesses, it's not that they're so much smarter. It's not so much they're just uh, such a high intellect, but being around it for a long time, I've noticed they just do the same things over and over again. And they do the things when most people want to go sleep, they're still doing them. <laughs> so that's one of them is, is just being consistent. Uh, I believe that men... I say this, men will applaud your ability and your gift, but they'll follow your consistency. Mm -hmm. I, I really I like believe that. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Um, and this, uh, the other one would be accountability. H how accountable are you to uh, the people that uh, help make up your team or the people that depend on you or when you give your word, uh, are you accountable to your word? It reminds me of a, a situation several years ago I had with a, a client that I brought on and uh, I was a salesperson then. And uh, it was a hard one to bring on. He was hard. He made me work uh, to get his business. But when we did what we call an orientation, uh, another person did that particular job. They went out to visit this client. And I never forget what she told me he said. She said, I was talking to him and he said, don't tell Kenny this. He said, but he's the first salesperson that's ever done everything he said he was going to do. He did it. Hmm. Now, that doesn't put pat me on the back. I just knew that I wanted this business so bad. I wanted to do a good job. But it showed me then that people appreciate how accountable you are to what you say you're going to do. And, and trying to find that today, Joel, is, is not easy. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's just not easy. All right, I want to hit four final questions as we round the bases. The first one, 
is going to be this. I was looking back at some USC records, and uh -huh. I see that in the 400 meters, the fourth fastest time in school history in the 400 was Ken Randall, June 4th, 1976, 44.99, which was a school record at the time, if I'm reading this correctly, broken in 1980, then broken in 92 and 99. That means that since 1976, only three men have run a faster 400, 400 meter time than you did, what, oh, 46 years ago or whatever it was, 45 years ago. What do you remember about that day, if I'm reading the stats right? Well, no, you, the stats are right. Uh, what In our nomenclature in, in track and field in America, what we used to do is during Olympic year, we would convert from yards to meters. Mm. So when I set that record, it was yards. And I broke the school record and set, and that record uh, is still there. Mm. And um, then we converted to meters and then everything got appropriated to meters. So my meters time was close to like 44.5. And, um, and we had some great 400 meter runners uh, come out of that. Um, to me, it was, um, I, I have a coach, I got a great coach and that's what changed and shifted gears for me. Uh, I had outstanding uh, high school, but I didn't know how to run that. I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> it wasn't until I got a real coach that, that showed me how to run it. And uh, he changed my entire paradigm uh, of running. The unfortunate piece was when uh, the Olympic year had passed, there was a rule at that point that if you ever went into professional sports, you couldn't go back to amateur. And so therefore, when I got drafted by the Cleveland Browns and went into professional football, all my aspirations and hopes of ever going back to compete uh, as an amateur Olympics, et cetera, et cetera, were gone. Couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, and that makes sense. And, you know, you, you get drafted in the NFL. Just a, a, a short, you know, little stint with the NFL. And even mm -hmm. when, you know, look, looking back at the USC stats, it doesn't look like you were the guy that was catching the touchdown passes. But I'm guessing that you were the guy that everybody knew was the fastest dude on campus. That mm -hmm. I mean, if you're if you're running that in the 400, nobody can catch you is what I'm I'm guessing. So my second question is what? What was your reputation around the football team and around campus at that point? I believe that, you know, you're right in everything you just assessed. But I was a football player first, uh, but I was just great at track and field. So I really mm. – when I, when I went to USC and I, uh, when they recruited me, they, they thought I would probably be in uh, – from an athletic standpoint, uh, uh, what O.J. Simpson did when he went to USC. He did both. He did track. He did football. Um, so they were looking at my football prowess, and that's what my freshman year, I got moved up to varsity after the first five games, uh, and went to, got on the varsity team. Um, so my reputation was, you know, just get it to him and that's it. So, cause it was more than speed. I actually had a few moves too. I used to laugh with Lynn Swan. He said, yeah, he'd say, you know, you're not just fast. He said, you got some good, uh, you run some great routes too. So for me it was. Uh, and I really, really believe that's why uh, even uh, when I got drafted, all the scouts came around. All my coaches could do was say, listen, you know, you get this guy and uh, and he's a, he's the kind of person that could make a difference on your team. So there was nothing ever negative. It wasn't like, oh, his hands are horrible or anything like that. But I really believe going back to what you said, my athletic uh, accomplishments in track and field oh, overshadowed the football. Mm -hmm. And rightfully so, the, we had some great people on that football field that were, were better than me. Um, but, you know, we all were a team. Yeah. Third question as we round the bases, I want to ask you a little bit more about, about your passion for ministry. And I, I like the way you put it to, I always think about some of these paths as being like, you know, limbs to a, a tree or branches that, that start to, to go in different directions. You, you referred to it as veins, which I think is even, even more significant or a better way to put it. So what does that mean to you, your work in the ministry at this point, amongst all the other things you're doing? Wow. Um, it, it was never known that that would be the route I would take. 
I always share with people um, that I believe coming into ministry, the Lord did me like uh, he, you take a little bird and put out crumbs in front of the bird and get the bird to come crumb by crumb. Because had he shown me the whole loaf, I wouldn't have eaten it. And I would have ran the other way because it was just not in my that was not a part of what I thought I would be doing. Um, but one thing I've learned uh, and I just heard this recently last week, actually, is that uh, God, if you believe in, uh, there is a God or whatever your spiritual beliefs are, it doesn't matter. But he looks around the corner and can see things and you can't because you're still on the same block. And he knew around the corner I was to come into this area. Um, uh, my mom was she was a believer and she went to church every Sunday and and but for me, every time I attempted to do something outside the realm of just what Kenny Randall wanted to do, for some reason, Joel, I was compelled to just come back and focus on this ministry, come back and focus on the people. And so it never let me go too far without winding me in. So I, I look at it like a fisherman. I think, believe that I just had a hook in my mouth. And no matter how far I ran out with that line as a fish, it always brought me back and I got reeled back in. So it became a passion because uh, I like helping people. I like I like the leadership aspects. I like helping people. I like sharing uh, uh, what God has done in my life. And as I always share people with people, I say, listen, I would I would rather defend an experience than debate theology. I, I, I don't debate beliefs. I just have an experience. And that leads me to the final question, the walk-off. And I think so much of what you have talked about on Rounding the Bases today will be, among other things, summed up in your upcoming book, When the Cheering Stops. Tell me about the, the book and when we can expect it. Okay. Yeah, the, the book, I have to give credit to my wife because when I came out of uh, sports, which was football, the last uh, sport I played, and got into corporate America, she said, you should write a book about what you have done, where you've come from, how you've matriculated through it all, because there's not a lot of people that have done what you've done and, and landed where you've landed. I said, okay, I thought it was a good idea, but it didn't become um, more prevalent until later. So um, I began to write about it. I began to write about what that transition was like. I began to write about um, things, for example, uh, developing your skills as a, at a young age and what that was like developing those skills and how hard you work to harness those skills. And I actually give some, some pretty interesting, colorful um, uh, examples of, of uh, stories. I actually color stories. These are real stories. Uh, I changed the names up, but these are real stories of people that I came up with and uh, how we, uh, endeavored to go through these different walks together about through sports. And I use a baseball, actually a baseball analogy uh, that was very prevalent. And then I move on from there into a, a progression like when you come to high school or um, now on a more professional level, being able to go to uh, the Super Bowl. I actually, when I was with the Cowboys, went to the Super Bowl. And we lost that Super Bowl game to Pittsburgh, but on the sidelines, I noticed two players that were all pro players and they were crying because mm -hmm. they were getting me into careers. And it showed me this was not about the money. It was about their passion for the game. And so I talk about in that book, the, uh, and it's really, people say you should always gear your book towards one particular focus. And it is about the athlete, but it's also those components in athletes like the parents, their coaches, their teachers, and themselves, and every role that each person plays in the life of that athlete, and then how we have a responsibility as we're bringing that athlete through. So sometimes we'll, we'll build athletes up on these giant pedestals, and then mm -hmm. when they fall, we want to run them out of town. It's kind of like an old Frankenstein movie. You want to run them off the cliff, but yet we did everything to build them up to this pinnacle. And so we talk about that. I talk about parents uh, not trying to live your dreams through your children, through your youth with children. That's, that's the biggest problem we've got today in no youth doubt. sports are parents. And I talk about how they need to take a deep breath and 
and really a how-to scenario. Um, I guess lastly, really helping that athlete on how to have a transition. I speak to how to transition from whether you ended sports in high school, whether you ended it in college, whether you ended in the professional level, there's always a transition. Now, I think it's harder at certain levels than others, but I give them a pathway. I give them in that book a way of being able to do it. And I end the book talking about how to run your own race, mm -hmm. how to get read, ready for the next phase and then how to dig down and, and what I call mine the gold, Joe, uh, that's deep. You got to go deep to, to mine gold and you got to go back and dig that gold out of your, uh, your ability and your character and bring it to the forefront. The book is called When the Cheering Stops. So there'll be a lot of life lessons in there, sports or life business. Yeah. When can we expect that? You uh, Right now, you can actually, uh, if you want to get a head start with me, the book will probably be out next month. Uh, but on my um, email address, uh, it's called Kenny's Book 21 at gmail.com. And if you email me, Kenny's book at gmail.com, I'll make sure you're one of the first that gets a pre uh, pre copy to you. Uh, just send me your information on there and I'll, I'll be glad to get it to you. I'm excited about it. Uh, it's I, it's finally finished. So I'm <laughs> I'm amazed by just I've let a few people read just some precursor uh, chapters. And I had uh, one of my, my assistant uh, who uh, handles a lot of business in my uh, work. She read it. And she's got a daughter in, that plays volleyball. And she came back to me four days later. And she says, I can't believe it. She said, I found myself in this chapter and I don't even compete in sports. And uh, that, that chapter is called Living in a Haunted House. That's when you know you have it. It's not just a sports book. It's, it's one that everybody can enjoy. So we'll look forward to that. Uh, so grateful to have met you. Looking to continue the conversations. Thankful to... Marquita Miller Joshua for, oh, for yes. allowing us to connect. There'll be more to come without a doubt, but thanks for dropping all, all of your wisdom and knowledge today and really enjoyed having you, Kenny, on Rounding the Bases. Joe, I appreciate you. Thank you for the show. Thank you.